We bow our heads and we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What comes to mind when you hear someone start talking about fishing? Do you think about old times where you'd go uh, fishing out with your grandpa and you'd have a great time and you'd be reeling one in after another and it seems like every cast you throw out, you've got another one? Or do you, do you have that other story where you've been out on the lake for about 10 minutes and you haven't caught a thing and you're ready to pack up and quit already? Maybe you've got one of those stories where, where you, you cast it out and you got a big one on the line and you were reeling it in and as you were reeling it in it got close to the boat and you could see just how big it was and when you tell the story of course you exaggerate how big that, that fish was because when it got right up to the boat it, it got away. Or maybe you think about or you hear people talking about fishing and the first thing you think is no thanks, uh, I'd rather stay home, I'd rather get stuff done around the house, or I, I, I'd rather sit and watch TV than waste my time trying to catch something. When you hear people talk about fishing, is the first thing that comes to mind Christian ministry? I think that if Jesus had heard people talk uh, about fishing, that might be the first thing that comes to his mind. As his ministry was starting to, to ramp up, as it began in Capernaum, he, he began to be eager to go fishing. And he was looking for people to join him. Now Jesus, uh, he's going into this land uh, of Galilee, uh, or a land that's called Galilee of the Gentiles. It's a land that's filled with people who are, who are all sorts of different nationalities. And the reason uh, being was because Gentiles inhabited that land. They didn't know the, the old Jewish customs. They didn't know what it meant to worship uh, like the Israelites. And, and that's because Zebulun and Naphtali, the, these places where Jesus was going into, uh, they, were, they, they were inhabited by people who were remnants of Jerusalem, or of the northern tribes of Israel getting taken over in 722 B.C. So as the Assyrians were, were conquering these northern tribes, they would send out uh, the, the people of different nationalities, people uh, of different race, out to Zebulon and Naphtali. And after the, the, the regions were conquered, these places started becoming quite populated with Gentiles, people who didn't know what it meant to worship God. So the, the Gentiles, not knowing who God was, not knowing who Jesus was, they were a people who were walking in darkness, in a land of the shadow of death. And you can kind of see this in two ways. Physically, these people literally were living in a pretty dark land because they were on the outskirts of Israel, so they were the first people that were attacked by any outside enemies. But spiritually, it was filled with people who likely had never heard about this Messiah, who likely had never heard about who God was. So they weren't waiting in eager expectation for Jesus. So these, these regions were, were likely littered by, by actions that the Jews would have looked at and, and said, unclean, I, I'm not going there. The, the pagan gods that, that many of these people probably looked to and, and looked at would have been things that probably made uh, the Jewish people very uncomfortable because they knew the truth and they saw the darkness of these people. You know, just a, a few summers ago, I was blessed with the opportunity to go over to Israel. And while in Israel, you realize that you're in a country where Christianity is not the norm. There were these, uh, these little minarets. They were like tall, skinny towers. And the minarets, they would burst out periodically throughout the day. And it was the Muslim call for prayer. 
And for someone like me, be, being a Christian, you know that these people are calling on a, a false God. You know they're looking at a false hope. And you feel somewhat uneasy about it. Because you know that these people are living in darkness. So with my eyes and with my ears, I could see, I, I could hear a people who were living in a land of darkness. But darkness isn't too far from us. I, I don't think we have to go uh, over the ocean to find, uh, to find a land that is living in darkness. We, in fact, can see darkness all around. We live in darkness all around. We live in, in a world where violence is often glorified in, in movies and TV shows. Um, we, we live in a world where hatred is often um, encouraged and sometimes even tolerate, or is tolerated and sometimes even encouraged in situations where that person was being a jerk. They just deserve it anyways. Uh, we live in a world where commercials and celebrities, they, they get on TV and they just talk about uh, needing more and more stuff in order to have peace, in order to be happy. But the more and more that, that you chase after that stuff, you realize you're less and less at peace and you're less happy. The darkness of sin around us, it blinds us. And it blinds the world from God. We're living in a land that is clouded by the shadow of death. But before we go out and we just condemn the world, we need to take a deep look at our own hearts as well. We were born in this way. We were born spiritually lost in darkness and headed to eternal death. Born with a, a sinful nature that not only was in darkness, but even desired to disobey what God says. And because the, of that sinful nature, we are often faced with a real temptation to become numb to our own sins of anger, of lust, of laziness, but quick to point them out in others. We're so plunged into this deep darkness of sin that it can be easy for you and for me to adopt some of those lifestyles as well. The, the lifestyles, the attitudes, the actions, the words. We're living in a land that is, is the shadow of death. And that's terrifying. Because the undeniable truth is that the darkness of sin is deserving of eternal death. And on our own, there was nothing we could do about it. We needed a light. We needed something to drive out this darkness. And here comes Jesus in his ministry. Notice what he says to the, those people. He says, repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come. Jesus says, turn from the darkness. God in flesh, I, I'm here, I, I've come. God in flesh is walking among the people. And he shined uh, as a light uh, brighter than any LED headlights that, you might, that might blind you as you're driving down the, the, the highway. And he drove away the darkness. But unlike the, those lights, he never burns out. We were standing in darkness, paralyzed by fear. Those people were terrified by darkness, not knowing where to go, standing in fear. But Christ turned on a light in your heart and those people's lives and showed people where to go. No longer do, do people in darkness need to search for the answer of, of what happens after death because Christ has shown us the answer. Christ has, has been the answer. He has given us the answer through himself. Our confidence is rooted in, in the light of life in Jesus Christ who drives away the darkness, who, who takes away the shadow of death. 
and he does it completely. He doesn't take away some of it, he takes away every single bit. Have you ever uh, let, a, let a little child play with your cell phone? And maybe you hand it to them and they start to like put it in their mouth or you hand it to them and boogers get all, all over your, your phone. It comes back to you probably a little slimy as you give it to, to a little kid. Well, you know there's a, there are these UV lights that apparently you can put your phone under and it'll take away like 99.9% .9 of the germs that are on that, that telephone. Jesus came into this world to shine as a light to those who are slimy, to those who are, are lost. He came in to, to shine as a light to those lost uh, Gentile nations of Zebulon, to, to, to shine as a light to those lost nations of Naphtali. And he radiates that message of forgiveness in the dark wastelands of our hearts, not to cleanse 99.9% .9 of sin, but all of our sins. Every single one of violence, of hatred, of greed, and now he delights in that new heart. He delights in the heart that, that he has, has turned on. And not only that, he says, come follow. Notice today in our lesson, you, you've got kind of, it's kind of broken into halves. You got the first half and then you got the second half where, where Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And now, then he goes out. He goes out and he starts to gather more followers. He starts to gather more disciples. And look at the men he chose to be his followers. They weren't any special men. They were fishermen. They weren't the, the, the Pharisees, the, the high religious leaders. They weren't the, the, the rulers at the time. But they were the blue-collared men who had calluses on their hands for, from working all day. They were salt-of-the-earth people who you could sit down and, and have a conversation with. Think about it. God could have sent angels. They could have done the, the ministry work. God could have sent them to, to come and to teach people about who Jesus was. But instead, he allows common, everyday people, uh, like these fish, fishermen, like us, to go out and spread his word. And as we look at all, all of our different roles in lives, maybe I can, I can put a, a few in, into your mind. Don't, you're not just a, a government worker, but, but you're a government worker who can work as a team with other people, who can show God's light as you're able to maintain that, that, that peace between one another, as you're able to maintain your sanity as things are going crazy. You aren't just a teacher in a school, but you're a model. You're a model of Christ's love to all of those students that you come into contact with. You aren't just a stay-at-home mom, but you're the face of God to each and every one of those children that God has blessed you with. Each person that we have the blessing to come into contact with, no matter what, what capacity it may be, is a soul. And unfortunately, there are many who are lost. There are many who are drowning in the ocean, just like we were when we were born, before Christ caught us with his gospel net. But fishing is a hobby that takes patience. Fishing takes a whole lot of, of patience. You, you go into that day as you're going out to, to, to fish, and you've got all this excitement. Maybe today you're going to bag your limit. Or maybe you won't even get a nibble. The same was true for those disciples as they went out fishing for men. Maybe today they'll, they'll talk to two, three people, and those people will listen uh, about who Jesus is, and maybe they'll come and they'll follow them. Or maybe today they'll throw out that gospel bait, and every time they throw it out, it seems like no one is even, is even touching it. But one thing they could be sure of, and one thing you can be sure of when you're fishing as well, if the bait is in the water, you've got a chance. 
As we share God's word uh, here in Ottawa, as we share God's word, um, let's get that bait in the water. And maybe we don't need to focus on, on how many people actually physically show up uh, in the pews, but maybe we can focus on how many we invited. How many times we got that, that bait out there? How many times we, we got people hearing the word of God? And as you do it, the Holy Spirit's with you. The Holy Spirit is working through you. The Holy Spirit uh, was working through those disciples. The Holy Spirit, he, he chose uh, Peter, uh, Andrew, James, and John to go along on this mission. And notice what God's word led them to do. They left behind everything. They left behind their nets. The, the first two left behind their nets and ran to follow Jesus. And then the second two, they even left behind their boats. Who knows how valuable the, the boats and the nets were at that time. But they left it behind and they followed. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to go quit your job right now and that you need to come and, and help us do ministry work here. But think about that commitment. Would I give up a little time watching TV to, to come and, and be a part of a church gathering or be a part of ministry work? Would I give up my own comfort to be willing to, to put myself out there on a limb and, and share God's word? Would we do that? It takes a selfless heart. And our Savior models that for you and for me. Jesus was perfectly selfless. I mean, think about what he left behind. Jesus was dwelling in heaven with God, and he came into this world. He entered into the darkness of sin, not with a goal to, to get him to follow or to get people to follow some lucrative business, and not with a goal to say, come, I, I can get all of your, your money if you follow me. But Jesus came with a goal of a ministry to give himself. With a goal to, uh, of preaching the message of who Jesus was to the entire world. To proclaim a sacrifice that takes away the darkness and that fills hearts with pardon and with peace with their God. There are times <laughs> where, where we fail. There are times where, where we might fail to perfectly trust God's message as he calls us to continue and to follow him. But even when we fail, he says, keep on coming. Because that's exactly what you need, is the comfort of the cross. He says, keep on coming, young and old, male and female, doesn't matter what, what race, what nationality, come follow me. But why? Why should I? Why should I give up my comfort? Why should I do that all in order to follow Jesus? Uh, why should I give up my money that, that could be used for some sort of entertainment for myself? Uh, why should I give up my time on Sunday mornings that I could spend having a pancake breakfast with my family? Because we have a selfless Savior who did that for us. And because he's powerful. And he promises to f fulfill everything he promises to you and to me. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Jesus put his money where his mouth was uh, among the people of that day. Uh, imagine uh, being one of those disciples. Imagine the amazement on Peter's face as disease and sickness was just fleeing from people uh, at Jesus' command. God promised that, that he was coming. God promised that a Messiah was going to come, one that, that was going to heal. God promised that a, a, a Jesus was going to come that was going to proclaim. That was exactly what this Savior was doing. And he brought that good news, but he wanted everyone to know that he was the Messiah. And that's why he did that. That's why he healed. That's why he, he, he provided so many miracles. And as he, go, as he went out, he went fishing for people. 
with the gospel message as his tackle and the disciples alongside of him, they went out. And Jesus would not stop until you and I were in his boat. Jesus didn't come into the world with his dims on. But he came shining brightly. He came shining a, a message of the kingdom of heaven. Because he cared. And he had concern for each and every person in this pew and each and every person in the world. What happens when, when there are those days that you feel much more like you're, you're, having, you're being shipwrecked rather than enjoying a, a peaceful day on the lake? What happens when there are those times where it feels, like, it feels more like you're walking through the, the, shadow of, the valley of the shadow of death rather than, than sitting beside those quiet, peaceful waters? Those moments expose our need. It shows us, yes, we live in a world that is filled with darkness. But they allow us to see that we so badly need light. And we have that light. That light, our hope, it is found in Jesus who came to heal, who came to, to be compassionate. Not only to Zebulun and Naphtali, but to those here in Ottawa. Our eternal life our eternal life threatening disease of sin, it has been cured. It has been driven away by the light of Christ. Now, if you're standing in a dark room and you've got a flashlight in your hand, but you don't turn that flashlight on, it's not going to do you any good. The flashlight has a purpose the light drives away darkness. You have the light. Follow it. The light of faith is turned on in your heart, and it's shining on you, and it's shining in you. God has given you the necessary tackle. And he calls you to, to find every soul, to fish. Jesus will be the one who drives away the darkness, but he calls you and me to follow and to fish for people. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand.